Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Eric Bricker, and welcome to A Healthcare Z's live Q&A session here on Friday, September 30th. Thank you all so much for being here. And we've got folks from all sorts of industries. We have folks who work with employer-sponsored health plans. We have insurance brokers and benefits consultants. We have folks from the pharmaceutical industry. We have folks from the health insurance industry. We have uh, folks who work with hospital systems. We have all sorts of the associated ecosystem. That seems to be a common word people use these days, the healthcare ecosystem. 10 years ago, we did not necessarily use the word ecosystem, but I guess that's what we do these days. So as always, you now have the opportunity to ask questions and you can do that in the comments, and then I'll be able to see those comments here on my side. So as you are getting started and thinking about your comments, I want to start off with some news, healthcare news. Now, it's actually healthcare news about healthcare news. I won't forget about uh, MSOs. Thank you so much, Dr. Sayed. I appreciate that. Um, so the news about the news. So I'm sure at, at this point, it's kind of old news. So last Sunday, there were two lead articles in the New York Times about hospitals driving high health care costs and, it's, and essentially taking advantage of patients, of people. Now, obviously, there's two sides to every story. But what was interesting about one of the New York Times pieces is that it was specifically about the Providence healthcare system, which is all the way out on the West Coast. It is in Oregon and Washington and California, and I think in New Mexico, and they might have like one hospital in Texas, but it's mostly in Oregon and Washington. Those are like the two big states. So why in the world would the New York Times write about a hospital system clear across the country? Well, that's a very interesting question. And so I think the connection there is that the CEO of the Providence Healthcare System is Dr. Rod Hockman. Now, Rod Hockman is a huge bigwig when it comes to hospital executives. And he has been a hospital executive for a very long time. And he, in fact, was most recently the chairman of the board for the American Hospital Association. And just recently, he is his term has passed, and now he's the immediate past chairman of the board of the American Hospital Association. So to a certain extent, the New York Times might have been specifically targeting Providence, and they essentially were going after uh, billing collections for impoverished patients who would have qualified for charity care, their hospital system, because there, there's actually state laws in, in Washington, Oregon, and California that says, look, if the person is poor, then you need to offer them charity care. And they essentially weren't doing that, and they were trying to go after them um, for collections, sending them to bill collectors, et cetera. And so to a certain extent, the New York Times might have been targeting Providence as a way of really trying to discredit the American Hospital Association so that when the American Hospital Association, Association was trying to go to congressmen and uh, congresspeople and senators, um, then to a certain extent, this article really damaged their credibility in terms of trying to, quote unquote, help patients vis-a-vis uh, -vis just trying to help their bottom line. OK, so that's fine. So that's one piece of news. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, there's two sides to every story, but of course, it's an excellent article to read. Okay, second piece is just five, six days ago, and this is like a totally different news piece. Joe Rogan, I'm sure you guys know Joe Rogan and his podcast and on Spotify. And so Joe Rogan has on a guest named Brigham Bueller, who is with uh, an, uh, sort of a health, you know, healthcare, you know, wellness organization that focuses on stem, that's focused on stem cells. So, but the point of this podcast was not about stem cells. So regardless of what your opinion is about stem cells, that's not really what this is about. The entire Joe Rogan episode, like two and a half hours, was essentially about all the topics that we talk about on A Healthcare Z. It was about the pharmaceutical industry. It was about the hospitals. It was about the PBMs. It was about the health insurance carriers and how they were all driving up the cost of health care and in many situations taking advantage of people. 
And I thought to myself, okay, well, here is a, a quote unquote, you know, news outlet that is like the polar opposite of the New York Times. But essentially, it was talking about the exact same things that the New York Times article was talking about. So it's just interesting that you have two completely different sides and spectrums of of the news media or just, you know, the media in general or just information, et cetera, et cetera, that are essentially uh, in, in financial terms, incriminating the U.S. healthcare systems in very similar ways. So anytime you have very different audiences actually agreeing about something, it makes you kind of stick your head up and look around and kind of wonder uh, what's going on. And so I think the way that I would tie this together to kind of open up our Q&A session, and I've seen questions come in, thank you so much, I'll, I'll, we'll get to them very shortly, um, is that the other trend is, is that this year in 2022, 62 hospital CEOs have stepped down. Now that is a 50% increase over last year, 2021 at the same point. So, and this is one of the highest levels of hospital CEOs stepping down in a very long time, if not ever. And so my point here is that you have to a certain extent, whether the, the New York Times and the Joe Rogan podcast are indicative of public sentiment rising and continuing to have, you know, angst and um, disagreement with the way healthcare is run by the incumbent players in the healthcare system, whether they be insurance carriers or hospitals or physicians or pharmaceutical companies or med device companies, et cetera, that discontent is being now borne by a new set of leaders. And the reason I want to bring this up is that, okay, so fine, you've got a new set of leaders. Really change happens when the old leadership steps down. And this occurs in many different um, areas of society. And in fact, it goes back very well. The most famous quote about this actually comes from a German physicist named Max Planck. If you guys, any of you know physics or science, you know Planck is a very famous name. And he said, I'm going to read his quote, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up familiar with it. Now, as it relates to healthcare, certainly we don't hope that anybody dies. We don't hope that any hospital CEOs die, but they retire or they step down, likewise with insurance CEOs and pharmaceutical CEOs, et cetera. And so really, as we work to improve healthcare, it is glacially slow. It is a generational activity. And to a certain extent, our expectations of how slow it's going to be are actually helpful because it helps us to be persistent. It helps us to have, whether it be from Joe Rogan or the New York Times or A Healthcare Z or from each of you individually in your conversations, it's slowly pushing the ball down the field and the march of time doesn't stop. And so what happens is, is all those leaders who establish and want to keep in place the status quo which is so bad for patients, they will eventually go away. They will eventually go away and be replaced. So all I'm saying to kind of wrap this up is that if we persist, there will be a new generation of leaders and there will be a new generation of patients and their expectations will be very different because of the activities of all of you and the media and what I'm trying to do on A Healthcare Z. So it's just a rallying cry to keep it up. So thank you so much for listening to me. That was my part about the news about the news. So let me go to your questions here. I see a whole bunch of come in. Thank you so much from that. Um, and I'm going through them right now. Welcome, everybody, from all over America. I see people from Wisconsin and Connecticut and everybody. So this is fantastic. Okay, so here we have one um, from, um, from Shoab. Again, if I uh, mispronounce anybody's name, I apologize in advance for that. Uh, hello, doctor. In your opinion, what is the best approach to transition from conventional fee-for-service payment to value-based 
payment system. What are the pros and cons of value-based uh, payment? Okay, so it's a great question. Very far-reaching. Again, I'm going to try to keep my answers relatively short so that we can get to more questions. So as I am answering this question, please uh, feel free to type in more as well. So the best the best approach <laughs> to transition from conventional fee-for-service payment to value-based payment, in my opinion, is to actually transition. <laughs> And not to like not transition. So right now, the quote unquote transition to value based payment is essentially to not transition, right? As I've mentioned many times before, huge swaths of the medical establishment, specifically specialists and hospital systems in America, uh, don't want to transition to value based care. They might say they want to, um, but in terms of their actions, they are not showing that they want to. In fact, I just had lunch uh, yesterday with a, um, a, a hospital uh, executive and their overall strategic direction, not in the direction of value-based care. Not much to his chagrin, like he wants them to go in that direction, but organizationally, not going in that direction at all. Um, no, they might say they are, but they are not in terms of their actions and their budget and their compensation. Uh, and they're building, et cetera. Okay, so, um, so so in other words, the transition, it actually needs to happen. It actually needs to move. So that's the first thing, is we need to be very careful about what we hear and what we read vis-a-vis -vis what's actually happening. So, uh, you know, you know, another example of that is CMS has vastly scaled back uh, and, C, excuse me, CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Center, um, has dramatically scaled back it's alternative payment programs, and the vast majority of them have failed. So the, again, don't don't think that this transit, you know, this transition is happening fast because one might argue it is barely happening. So what do, what what do you what do you do with that information? Um, pain causes change, and so to a certain extent, there will the, the, almost the word transition almost sounds like it is an unpainful process and arguably pain is necessary for the, the change to happen. So I, I think the idea of changing from fee-for-service to value-based care being um, in, you know, independent of pain or not having any pain I don't think that's possible because you need to have the pain to actually facilitate the change. So that is, I think that's just a reality as we look at the situation. And of course, nobody wants to talk about pain. I mean, you will hear whether it be executives or politicians or even, you know, patients' rights groups, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody wants to come out and explicitly talk about the painful process it will be. But look, when we transitioned from the horse and buggy to the car, that was very painful for horse ranchers and buggy whip makers in America. When we transitioned to um, electronic switching for telephones, that was very painful for switchboard operators. So let's not be disillusioned that progress requires it to be painful for some people. And as a physician, I'm okay with that because ultimately, who is feeling the pain right now are patients. So if you don't have pain within the people that are working within the industry, then the patients will continue to feel the pain. So in order to diminish the suffering, the financial exploitation, the lack of access, the inequality, in order to address these pain points for patients, for people who are sick, who have cancer, who have trouble breathing, who are bleeding, like in order to diminish their pain, it has to be painful for people within the industry. And it's that sand within the oyster that creates the irritation that then creates the pearl of progress. I'm sorry if I apologize for my ridiculous analogies. Um, but anyway, that would be my answer to your question. Thank you so much for answering, uh, for asking that. Okay. And I'm keeping going down. Okay, this is so. I also have viewers on um, YouTube. 
and they're putting in comments as well. So thank you so much to the YouTube folks in addition to the LinkedIn audience. And this is from, uh, you know, on YouTube, people don't actually have their names in all the time. Sometimes they'll have, you know, other sort of titles or things they put. So this is from The Climb Journey. So I had a prospect tell me the other day, we are barely getting by, but we are sticking to the status quo for our health insurance. It was unbelievable. Okay, great point. Now, um, they are likely a, a, an insurance broker, benefit consultant going out and talking to a, a prospect, typically, you know, HR head of benefits, what have you. And that bring, and I would say that that reaction in the employer community, that's actually the status quo. That's actually fairly common. Now, ultimately, I would say that there are, a, you know, it, the health insurance sale is a complex business to business sale. And I'll just add right now that the best book about complex business to business sales is a book called Hope is Not a Strategy. Because this is true whether you're selling a, a health insurance plan or you know, some sort of new logistics, you know, system for your manufacturing plan. I mean, it's when anytime you have a complex business to business sale, you're not buying this is the big difference between business to business sales and business to consumer, is that when you're doing business to business sales, you're dealing with a buying committee as opposed to an individual. And that buying committee by definite and any committee is committee is just more than one person. So it could, it could be two people. It could be 10 people. Um, obviously, small organizations, it might be like the head of HR and the CFO or it might be the head of HR, the CFO and the CEO. So it's a buying committee that's very small, whereas you have a very large organization. Like I said, it might be, it might be the benefits manager, the director of comp and benefits, the VP of HR, the CFO and the CEO. Some of the people on the buying committee you can't even get to. Like you're not going to be able to talk to the CEO of a very large organization about their employee health plan. Right. The statistic is, is that the typical CEO only spends 30 minutes a year thinking about their employee health plan. So like chances are you as any sort of outside vendor are not going to get a part of that 30 minutes. They're only going to talk to internal people about that. So that uh, stickiness of the status quo really comes out of, and there's lots of HR people that they are understandably focused on job preservation. So like if they don't have an edict or a directive from the executive team or leadership or literally from Bob or Mary, the CEO, then they're not going to totally stick their neck out and be like, we have to change our employee health insurance plan when the CEO isn't calling for it. So there, in that particular situation where they say they quote unquote are barely getting by, but they're sticking with it. What that means is, is that one, they either don't have enough pain or two, they do not view making a change in their insurance as a way to rectify their pain. And I will tell you that we specifically saw this at Compass during the great financial crisis 2008 to 2009-10, where if an employer is having a dramatic decrease in sales because of inflation or because of whatever sort of economic problems that we are you know, having or potentially having right now, that really their number one cost cutting um, tool in the toolbox is frankly layoffs because it's fast, because they can see the improvement in their uh, bottom line or their expenses very rapidly. And in fact, there was a LinkedIn uh, survey that showed that 70% of employers are actually um, actively looking at layoffs or considering layoffs or have done layoffs. 70%. Now, obviously, we haven't seen that many layoffs in the news, so most of them are not doing it. But they are actively considering it because that's like the first and fastest thing that you can do to cut your expenses. So just, and we saw that in the great financial crisis that, you know, I would go out and I would try to talk to employers about how to lower their healthcare costs, et cetera, et cetera, as with their broker consultants. And they were so busy laying off people for 2008 and 2009 for two years that they didn't come around and try to be more quote unquote surgical in their expense reduction because actually taking a look at your employee benefits plan you know, it requires more effort. It's not going to pay back as quickly. Um, it's more complicated than just laying people off. And so in the, so this is, what's my point? This is part of the natural progression. So, you know, in, you know, in change, in facilitating change, I would say that timing, probably at least 50% of it might even be closer to 80% of it. So like what you, the climb journey said to that employer 
like, and your credibility and your expertise, et cetera, et cetera, like your own personal mousetrap, like might be exactly what that employer needs. It was just the wrong time. And that's why persistence is so important. You just need to keep in touch with that employer. And listen, the last thing you need is advice from me. But I would just keep, you know, keep talking to folks and I'd be, okay, six months later, a year later, a year and a half later. And we would eventually like bring them on as a customer because the timing needed to be right within the organization. They needed to get through all of those layoffs in order to then, you know, get up, you know, get up for air. Because of course, when they're doing these layoffs, the head of benefits and HR is also looking around saying, well, am I going to get laid off? So all that kind of had to pass. And then, and it was interesting, different companies were at different sort of phases in terms of how many layoffs they had to do, how quickly they did them, how quickly they could come up for air and actually think about other things like their employee benefit plan. So it wasn't true across all industries that different uh, types of businesses um, sort of addressed these things in, uh, in different ways. And as you can imagine, one of the most consumer spending um, um, addressed um, industries is um, is ho is hospitality. So uh, for restaurants, we had uh, restaurants and and retail. So hospitality and retail, because as soon as consumer spending goes down, they've got to they've got to decrease their headcount super fast because it happens literally within weeks that they are you know people stop coming into the restaurants or stop buying at the store. So it happens super fast, and then they you know they got through their you know they were called reduction force riff or lay layoff whatever and then they were the ones who most quickly came around and said okay we got to do something about our employee health plan let's look at a couple of professional health services and a new broker or what have you about a way to do that so again great question thank you so much for asking that okay great now uh mark thank you so much for your question will the new generation of leaders that change healthcare or a change in economic incentives? So that's a that's a great question. And really the answer is both. And as in many things, when things are changed, it is typically not uh, one thing that causes the change. It's multifactorial. Now, there tends to be a catalyst that starts to knock down the dominoes, but it is, it is, a multifactorial um, thing that happens. And so let me give you an example of that. So, and this is, um, gosh, you know, I, I'm sorry to have to give you a crazy, boring history lesson, but um, so, and I've made an A Healthcare Z video about this a long time ago. So actually doing, you know, sort of, you know, Medicare, like uh, the, the LBJ administration did in the 60s, like, FDR actually wanted to do that back in the 1930s when he was putting in Social Security. So that had been on his agenda, but he couldn't get it done. And he's like, okay, well, he had to choose. He's like, okay, well, I can either do Social Security and this, you know, um, this Medicare type program, but he couldn't get them both in. And so he ditched the Medicare part. He said, okay, I'm just going to focus on the Social Security part. And then, and Truman tried to do the same thing after him. So it had been something that had wanted to be done, but they just didn't have the ability to do that. And so interestingly, part of the reason why LBJ was able to pass Medicare was because it wasn't his idea. It sort of like the ACA, it actually started with two separate uh, congressional acts that they were, or bills, I should say, that they were trying to get passed into law. And so everyone gives LBJ for the credit for doing this. And look, and he signed the thing, but it actually came up through Congress. And it actually came through two separate bills. And that's why we have Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B is because they were two separate bills that happened. And so that was, what's what's my point as it, as it relates to it? Now, so in your point, Mark, about a change in leadership, okay, so it couldn't have happened during Eisenhower because that was not the right leader who wanted to make that a priority. And this is not a political discussion whether he was right or wrong to do that. That's just how it was, okay? Now, so you had to have the, the leadership in place that was good sort of fertile soil for those uh, planted seeds to grow in. And then you needed, the you needed it to bubble up from the bottom 
in terms of the, and one might argue to your question mark, that the economic incentives were such, which you had seniors in America that were getting, they didn't have the money and they just were not getting medical care or it was a huge uh, economic burden to themselves. They had to sell the farm or whatever in order to take care of, you know, mom. And it was a huge burden on their families, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really, it's not a question of one or the other. It's really a question of both and. And you have to have um, really sort of the the milieu or the right soup together along with a catalyst to then make it happen. And that takes time and it takes uh, persistent effort. So I think it'll, I th again, I'm hugely optimistic. Like I, I know it will happen. Um, it's just a question of when. It might not even be during my career, my lifetime. And I'm okay with that. I, you know, as long as we keep pushing the ball down the field, then we're just going to keep at it. Okay. Next question by uh, Gibran. Thank you so much for this question. Uh, why is there more adoption of VBC value-based care in uh, MA? I assume that's Medicare Advantage, or it could, I guess it could be Massachusetts, um, than commercial. Okay, so it's uh, Medicare Advantage. Uh, and how to change? Does higher fee-for-service cost in commercial play? Okay, so it's a great question. So Medicare Advantage, by definition, like the creation of Medicare Advantage was value-based care. They didn't call it value-based care. You know what they called it? They called it capitation. So really in its purest, and that's been around for forever, but uh, not for forever, but um, obviously that's been around since the, shoot, the 1960s with HMOs. They were doing capitation back then. Um, that was the whole, you know, Kaiser, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So um, Medicare Advantage, again, this was, uh, in, when it was initially put in place, it was a, you know, it was a capitated payment to health insurance companies. Now, you have the risk adjustments such that those capitated payments by beneficiary vary depending upon the disease level of each individual beneficiary, but it was still a capitated payment. And, the, and Medicare said, okay, now insurance company, we're going to give you $1,000 a month for this beneficiary, $800 a month for this beneficiary, $2,000 a month for this beneficiary, and you're on the hook for taking care of them for the year. That by definition was a value-based um, decision. So it was really, and, and I, that, that's why to a certain extent, the, I honestly think, and I, I, you know, there's no difference between being early and being wrong. So I might just be early or I might just be totally wrong that the entire term value-based care, it might just go away because it is just, all it is, is, is capitation. And so we might have a, a new term that is also a euphemism for capitation, but like the 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 ultimate structure for Medicare Advantage is capitation. Now, to your question, which is an excellent one, will capitation then come to employers? So interestingly, that is those that idea of capitated payments is essentially a fully insured plan, okay? But the difference is, is that the entire group's premiums then go up. The insurer can come back to the employer and be like, well, we're going to increase your premiums. Okay, whereas in Medicare Advantage, the insurance company can't just go back to the federal government and be like, Hey, federal government, we're going to increase your rates this year. Like you, you can't do that. The federal government says no, right? And so what is the no of the commercial market? The no of the commercial market is voting with your feet and changing carriers. And so really for an effective fully insured market or an effective, effective capitated uh, market to happen, you need to have more competition in the insurance space so that it's easier to say no and vote with your feet. So my ultimate vision for how that happens is you have more hospital systems themselves create health insurance plans so that you don't just have Blue Cross United Cigna Aetna, but then you also have the St. Mary's health insurance plan and you have the, um, the, 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 
you know, what, you know, pick your hospital system health insurance plan, which, you know, you right now you have, right? The UPMC health insurance that you buy, you can buy Intermountain health insurance in Utah, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's, you can buy Centara insurance in a Virginia Beach, Virginia. So it is, it is incredibly small. Now, hospitals, and, and I, ultimately, if I was in, you know, I have insurance brokers that tell me, look, we don't really have a lot. I mean, there's not only, really, quote unquote, much brokering we can do because you don't have a lot of choices. If there's not a lot of choices, then there's not really not much brokering that's done. So to a certain extent, back when like MetLife was doing health insurance, that was a much better time to be an insurance broker because you had more, um, did I say life insurance? I meant health insurance. When MetLife was doing health insurance, that was a better time to do um brokerage because you had more choices. You could actually be a broker. And so if you have hospital systems offering more choices and employers have more choices, um, that, and you can use a wrapper network for you know your employees that are outside of certain areas, et cetera. I'm sorry, I mean, it's not going to be a perfect solution, but you can totally do it for these uh, employers that generally have their employees in one geographic area. So, um, so again, I'm optimistic. I think that'll happen. I think that'll take pain within hospital systems to realize that they need to get the money up front in the form of capitated payments via premium from employers. But they're not going to do that um, easily. They're going to do that kicking and screaming. And so it's going to require pain for them to move in that direction. In my opinion, that's healthy pain. But um, anyway, long-winded answer to your question, uh, Gibran. Thank you so much for asking that. Hey, question here. Uh, Melissa, thank you so much. If it were easy, everyone would be doing it. If uh, stats hold true, it takes 14 years for an evidence-based practice to be fully implemented. Yes, in the clinical side, that's absolutely the case. How do we speed this up and how do we empower the patient's voice to encourage this action? Okay, so that's a, that's a great question. And let's specifically talk about the adoption of evidence-based you know, treatments or diagnostic uh, protocols, et cetera, et cetera, in that it does take a very long time for them to be adopted. So what happens is, is that if there's a better way to treat a cancer or to treat diabetes or to, to, to treat congestive heart failure, many patients essentially suffer because they don't get the evidence-based approach. Um, now, a few dynamics around that. So, um, because there's two sides to every story. So one, typically the, um, the academic physicians at university hospitals across the country, they tend to be the earlier adopters of these evidence-based practices. So that, again, as a consumer, as a patient, as a person, the best thing that you can do is not to try to convince your doctor to, um, to use evidence-based ide you know, ideas or, or practices, et cetera, et cetera, is to leave your doctor. Now, going and leaving your doctor requires pain on the part of the patients. And what is that pain? It is, it is geographic inconvenience. You have to travel. So the question as a consumer that you, or as a patient that you need to ask yourself is, do you want convenient non-evidence-based care or do you want inconvenient evidence-based care, because you can't have both. Now, telemedicine's helping out with that a little bit, but to a large extent, it's not. So you just have to decide what's more important to you. And listen, for a lot of minor things like an upper respiratory tract infection, you might go in, and so most of those are viral. Um, you, you get tested for COVID, it's not COVID. Okay, so it's, it's some sort of you know uh, a flu which, or, or a cold, which is rhinovirus. Okay. The community doctor might still give you antibiotics. If you did that at an academic medical center, they'd probably not give you antibiotics. Like at the end of the day, you probably get better anyway. You probably only spent about six bucks on the antibiotics. You probably maybe had a little bit of an upset stomach or some diarrhea from the antibiotics that you probably didn't need to get. But at the end of the day, it's not a huge deal. And you get better and it saved you the, you know, the hour and a half of battling traffic and the parking and having to wade through the huge academic medical center to find the offices or whatever. So in some situations, like it's not a huge problem, but when it comes to more major and what are more major issues, obviously it's things like we are considering major surgery or you are, are, have a new cancer diagnosis or you have 
very uh, serious, you know, heart condition, whether it be like, you know, even like congestive heart failure or, um, is, you know, or uh, coronary artery disease, where it might behoove you to inconvenience yourself to go there. And what does that do? Again, pain causes change. If the community phys physician sees that they're losing patients because they are not, um, you know, following evidence-based, you know, care, then that's going to change their practice pattern more so than you trying to individually persuade, you know, a, a doctor to, to change their practice patterns. Like, so I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even try to have a quote unquote, um, you know, argument with your doctor around what they're going to do because, you know, most doctors, myself included, we tend to be fairly arrogant and stubborn and we don't, we tend to be not very open-minded in terms of our patients telling us like what to do. So like in that case, you just need to find somebody else and that's okay. You're free to do that. But typically there's a lot of fear. Um, they don't want to, um, frankly, a lot of people just have fear around driving to new places. A lot of people, it's like, okay, I have the time, but it's kind of scary to drive to someplace new. And um, it, it's in a part of town that you're not familiar with, et cetera, et cetera. So th the best thing that you can do is to get a second opinion at an academic medical center. I mean, that's my opinion. Other people could differ, you know, could have a different, but even to this day, I mean, the appropriate treatment for congestive heart failure, I mean, it involves quite a few medications. Like if you're on evidence-based care for congestive heart failure, it might be like five or six medications. And that combination of medications is typically like people only get like two of them. So, I mean, there could be a, a radical change. In fact, Walmart did this with its second opinion program where it would send people to the Mayo Clinic as the second opinion for people's cancer. And literally 50% of the time when they sent them to Mayo, their treatment plan changed. So like it is not, it's not like it's a standard of care across America that everybody's following. I mean, half the time it was totally different. And on top of that, it was, it was like 15% of the time, the diagnosis even changed. Like you don't have cancer or the type of cancer you were told you have, you actually have a different type of cancer because literally the diagnosis of cancer involves a pathologist looking at the cells underneath a microscope using some special stains and literally how the cells look tells the person what type of cancer it is. And so they have the pathologist at Mayo like re-review the slides and 15% of the time, even the, so sometimes inflammation, like dramatic inflammation can look like cancer and it can be inflammation from an infection. It can be an inflammation from a, an autoimmune disease. So they'll look at it and they'll be like, oh no, you don't have cancer. You just, I mean, there was actually a gentleman in our neighborhood where they thought that he had, um, they thought he had a tumor uh, in his ear. And it turned out that he just had a really bad ear infection. Um, you, so, you know, and I've seen that happen with, um, with throat cancer too. They're like, Oh, you know, you've got throat cancer and no, they just had a horrible case of a throat infection that just looked like cancer, but upon second review, it was not. So thank you for, thank you for your question. I appreciate that. Okay, just looking through. Thank you for being patient. And um, I'm going through. Okay. Um, from uh, Mike, thank you for your question. So um, could you paint the picture of payer provider contract negotiations? Who is at the table? And what are the key points of contention? So of course, made a healthcare video, a healthcare Z video about that. So if you just go to YouTube and type in a healthcare Z in the in the search uh, box, and then type in hospital prices or contract negotiation, um, then it'll it'll pop up. So a healthcare Z hospital prices or a healthcare Z um, contract negotiation, then those videos will pop up. Um, but in brief. What happens is, so first of all, you have to understand the parties that are at the table. So typically for a large hospital system, there's like a VP of contracting who typically reports to the CFO, but it's typically like one person. And then they have like a small team of analysts that support them. And then on the carrier side or on the network side, they typically have like regional contract negotiators. So I was actually on a panel with the West Coast gentleman for uh, United Healthcare. And he's got kind of a small team as well, but they would go around 
to the major hospital systems. And then he had a team because obviously they had to go around to like the physician groups as well. So he personally couldn't meet with all those folks, but they, but that's who is, um, is sitting down and going through this. And so as you can imagine, these contracts, one, take a very long time to negotiate. So it's not like they just sit down for one afternoon and you're done. I mean, it's, a, it's like an, a year and a half process. Those contracts are only renegotiated about every three to five years. And so what they do is they put in evergreen inflationary clauses that say that, hey, the overall reimbursement from you know, XYZ carrier or to this um, hospital system is going to go up by 8% every year. And that's where trend comes from. So when you get a fully insured renewal and you're like, okay, you know, so maybe the, maybe the, the demographics of your uh, employees changed, but then, you know, so it might be like on the, on the age of your employees, or it might be on the gender mix of your employees, but also on your fully insured renewal, oftentimes they'll put in a percentage point of trend in there, 8% trend. And what that 8% trend is, is actually a manifestation of those evergreen clauses in the contract that caused the contract to inflate every year by let's say 8%. Now, of course the insurance company doesn't want that, but the hospital system, especially it's a very large hospital system, like negotiates that in. And that's just, and that's precedent. That's been done for years, years, if not decades. So when they sit down and they negotiate it, you got to understand. And again, there are multiple contract terms. I won't go through everything here. There are multiple contract terms in terms of the way things are reimbursed. So it's not just a discount off of bill charges. So it's not just like, hey, we're going to bill a thousand bucks and then you know, across the United Signet and it's like, okay, well, we get a 50% discount off of that. So then they get paid $500. Okay. So there are things that are called case rates where no matter what the hospital bills, the they're going to get reimbursed. 500 bucks, let's say, or a thousand bucks. And let's say that's for an MRI. Like for a lot of times for outpatient imaging at the hospital, they'll have fixed case rates. Hey, for the MRI, it's going to be a thousand bucks. No matter, no matter what you can build 2000, you can build 10,000. You're getting a thousand bucks. Okay. So that's a case rate. Now there are then percent of charge services as well, oftentimes used for outpatient surgery. Uh, and those are the really expensive ones. Health insurance carriers, as you can imagine, they want the fixed case rates and the hospitals really want the percent of charge discounts. Whereas, so in, in, you know, it could be anywhere from only a 20% discount or it could be a 50% discount. And there, the reason why the hospital wants the percentage charge discounts is because through the charge master, then all, which is the list of all the prices for everything, you know, an aspirin's two bucks, a bag of IV saline is $110 and you add all that up and that adds up to the bill charges for that service, you know, block, you know, 30 minute blocks of OR time. And so what happens is, is that the hospital increases the, uh, the, the, the build amount. So, you know, the, the price of the aspirin goes up, the IV bag goes up, the, um, the OR time goes up. They just turn that up. And let's say that there was a 50% discount off of bill charges for um, outpatient arthroscopic knee surgery, like for like an ACL repair. And they can increase the bill charges from 10,000. Then in the next year, it could be 12,000. Then in the next year, it could be 15,000. Then in the next year, it could be 20,000. And they continue to get 20% of that number. So they're going to continue to get paid more and more as they ratchet up the bill charges. And that's just built into the contract. So there's also carve outs, which is where a specific implant, like a pacemaker or the actual joint itself in a total knee or a total hip replacement are a line item of reimbursement such that for that line item of that knee implant, the insurance carrier has agreed with, with the hospital to pay them like 15 grand just for the implant itself. And then there are also what are referred to as provider stop losses, where it's a fixed case rate up to a certain level of bill charges. And then after which it flips from a fixed case rate to a percent of charge reimbursement rate. So typically for more complex surgery, let's say it's for a cabbage coronary artery bypass graft, where the, the fixed case rate will be $20,000 up to build charges of $40,000. But as soon as the build charges hit $40,001, then it moves to a percent of charge. And let's say the percent of charge is a 50% discount, 50% reimbursement, such that when the cabbage actually costs 60 grand in build charges, then the hospital gets paid 30 grand instead of the previous fixed case rate of 20 grand. And then the hospital specifically sets up its charge master so that it blows through that, that quote unquote provider stop loss level of 40 grand for every single cabbage that they do. So 
the, the last thing that I will add to this is that when I was talking to a hospital executive, they told me that they are they and, and the the financial folks the hot the, doc, the docs have no clue but the financial folks look at the types of patients that come in and it's for major surgery and then it's for icu stays that have those those types of clauses that i just described and those are the big money makers for hospitals and they typically get one claim one one patient like that out of about 30. And so for every 30 patients, you got a whole bunch with case rates, you got a whole bunch with, you know, percent of charges and carve outs, but about one out of those 30 is one of those provider stop losses where they get very, you know, you're talking, you know, hundred grand, half a million dollars of billed charges. And so the hospital is going to get paid 250 grand on that. And that, and, and that one out of 30 people is also commercially insured. They're not on Medicare or Medicare Advantage. So they're on an employer-sponsored health plan. So really the intersection of one of those diagnoses or procedures, so sepsis in the ICU, coronary artery bypass graft, with a commercial, it, it happening to a commercially insured patient, when that happens, that, ha that intersection happens about one every 30 times, and that is a huge moneymaker for the hospital. And the financial folks within the hospital actually bank on that. Like that's what, because they, they need to make their numbers every month. And so they need one of those, they need those people, one out of every 30 patients coming through to hit that. Those are like, you know, this is a crass um, analogy, but those are like the whales at the casino. Those are the ones who are coming in and gambling a ton of money and losing a lot at the casino. So again, it's it's high con it's it's high stratification. So it's not that hospitals make a ton of money off of all their patients, it's that they're looking for those select few with a specific diagnosis with a specific contract term who's commercially insured. Likewise, if you're the employer sponsored health plan, then you have your members who, you know, you're not paying out a ton on them, but you're getting one out of 30 where, you know, you're paying out 250 grand because it specifically went through that provider stop loss contract term that took the 500,000 of build charges and turned it into 250 grand being siphoned out of your uh, employee benefits budget. Okay. Anyway, that's probably more than you wanted to know. Um, but thank you so much for that question. Okay. I'm still going through. Thank you so much. Okay. This is from, uh, it's from YouTube and it's from enthusiast. Um, and, uh, their question is are value-based healthcare initiatives leading to physician burnout on the other hand? How are physician viewing, physicians viewing penalties in terms of losing their tier status or financial penalties? So that's, a, that's a great question. So right now, because the vast majority of payment is still fee for service and we have tremendous burnout, in my opinion, fee for service is the reason for the burnout. It's not value-based. Now, why is fee for service causing the, the burnout? Because it's all based on patient volume. The more patients you see, the more you can bill and the more fees you can collect, both either individually for yourself as a physician or for the physician practice, or even for the hospital, because all those things have facility charges for the OR or for the emergency room time, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's really the push for productivity. Productivity meaning lots of visits a day, not 20 visits a day, 25 visits a day, 30 visits a day, 35 visits a day. That, okay, if you're going to accomplish that many visits in a day, then you need to do two things, one of two things, or both things. You either need to see each patient for less amount of time. Okay, I used to see a patient for seven minutes. Now I'm only going to see him for five. Or you have to just spend more hours in the day. Okay, I'm still going to see patients for seven minutes a patient, but instead of you know only seeing those those patients from nine to five, I'm going to have to do it from eight to six. And a lot of times this happens not with their clinic hours, but it happens then in the office or excuse me in the hospital where they then are you know they're seeing consultations, um, and and in the hospital then obviously you could solve that problem by just hiring more physicians, but they don't want to do that right because then they'd have to pay them. So it's like, okay, we got, you know, and a, a service that gets a lot of consultations might be like, uh, so GI and renal, they get a lot of consultations. So GI is for GI bleeds and they got to get an upper endoscopy or a lower endoscopy. And so the GI doc is running around the hospital doing all these consults being like, okay, you don't need to be scoped. You need to be scoped tomorrow. You need to be scoped in two days. And it takes a while to do all that evaluation. 
And a lot of times, especially on the weekend, that, that they have one GI doc covering multiple hospitals. So it's not unusual for that one GI doc over the weekend to cover two or three hospitals. So you have to see gobs of patients at three hospitals. And I wouldn't see the GI doc until like 5 p.m. at my hospital. And I'm like, where have you been? He's like, I've been at the other two hospitals all day. He'd been rounding on patients since 6 a.m. in the morning. And here it is 11, 11 hours later. And he's only making it to my hospital now. And, you know, he was there until like nine at night. And so then you get up and you do it again. And you do that all weekend long. And then you got to do it all during the week again. And so just, just you, you got to rush. You got to see a ton of patients. It's very stressful um, because you constantly have people like me, the hospital is calling you being like, where are you? This person is actively losing blood in the bed. You know, and he's like, well, I'm, I'm two hospitals away. I'm not going to get there until 5 p.m. You got to transfuse them some more. So you could solve that by hiring more GI docs, but they don't want to do that because they can have, you, you have more patient visits per GI doc. Okay, so that's probably more detail than you want. Okay, on the flip side of that, value-based care typically involves capitated payments that are then managed by the primary care physician. And in those primary care models, they take the patient panel down dramatically. The typical patient panel for a primary care physician is about 3,500 patients. They take that down to about 500. So it's one-seventh the size. And by taking it down to one-seventh the size, you can see the patient for seven times longer. So seven times seven minutes is 49 minutes. So that's where you get a visit with a primary care physician for close to an hour, as opposed to only seven minutes. And that actually reduces the stress for the primary care physician, because there's so much that you need to do as a primary care physician, you cannot do that well in seven minutes. So it actually gives you the time to take an adequate history, to do an adequate physical, to adequately counsel the patient. Modifying the patient's behavior is the A number one thing that's going to keep them better. There's a story that one of the Chen Med docs told me where he got the patient to drink um, seltzer water instead of co Coca-Cola, and it dramatically improved their diabetes. And the guy really liked the carbonation. That's what he really liked. And so just by getting him, I mean, that, that's 10 times better than any medication you could possibly take to stop drinking soda and instead switch to, to seltzer water, right? But it took a long conversation. It took multiple conversations. You can't do that in seven minutes. It took a while for him to figure out why he even liked drinking this stuff. He's like, why do you keep drinking this stuff? And he's like, well, I keep drinking it in cans instead of two liters. Why are you drinking in cans? Because that keeps the fizz better. If you get it in the big two liter, then it gets flat and then I don't like it. Oh, okay. Fantastic. That all takes time. So, um, so, the, the flip side, the problem with that for specialists is that it creates the flip opposite problem of burnout. So there, when you effectively treat people with primary care, they don't get referred to specialists. And then specialist patient volume dramatically drops. So you'd say, okay, well, specialists should like that because they're not getting burnt out. And that holds true if the specialists are being paid a salary. So really the key to making value-based care work in a multi-specialty practice or in a major hospital, and the Ochsner Health System in New Orleans did this, is to put the specialist on salary. Put the primary care doctors on salary too. So that way, if the orthopedic surgeon and the general surgeon and the ENT get fewer referrals, then they're not fighting mad about it because their income is preserved. And the overall hospital system and the overall healthcare costs still go down. So you could literally keep the pay of the specialist the same. Specialist is making 400 grand a year, half a million dollars a year. Their patient volume, let's say it goes down by 20%. Where it saves is in the facility fees. So you're doing 20% less specialist facility fees. And it's facility fees that are eight times, 20 times more than the professional fees. And as a result, the Ochsner Health System was able to save a ton of money. Okay, how are they able to monetize that? They went in with risk contracts with Medicare Advantage plans, such that when their facility fees went dramatically down, they weren't billing fee-for-service for those Medicare Advantage folks anyway, because they were getting lump sums from the Medicare Advantage plans, and then they were keeping the difference 
between what the Medicare Advantage plan was paying them and the fact that their hospital system had fewer costs. Now, does that mean that their operating rooms were less busy? Yes, it means that they're less busy. But again, you're not going to lower healthcare costs unless you lower the volume of so much of what being done. Remember, a third of everything that's done in healthcare is waste and doesn't need to be done. So you're chipping into that third and you don't get rid of all the third. You only need to get rid of a little bit of it. Of it. And it just dramatically improves the overall financial performance for everybody. And in fact, Ochsner had one of its best financial years during COVID when their patient volume dropped They uh, because people weren't getting the surgeries. They actually were not suffering like so many other um, hospital systems were. So I, there's much more to that story. I won't get into too much detail about it, but thank you so much for that question. Okay, this is a question from uh, from Sammy Clemens with a picture of Mark Twain. So I think it's a, a, a play on Samuel Clemens. Thank you, Sammy Clemens from, uh, from YouTube. Um, and this will be the last question. We're coming up on the hour. So thank you so much for being here. And Sammy Clemens asks, you said value-based care is just capitation. Are you using that term also uh, covering things like bundled payments? Okay, let me just pause right there. He's got other parts to his question. Let me pause there. Okay, it's a great question. So a bundled payment is capitation at the individual procedure level. It is not capitation at the person level. So that's the big difference is that a bundled payment is, is that, hey, for this entire episode of a total knee replacement for the preoperative care, for the operation, for the facility, the anesthesiologist and the orthopedic surgeon and the postoperative care, the recovery, whether it be PT, et cetera, et cetera, you're getting in that bundled payment, let's say it's 25 grand for all that, including any readmissions. So it's sort of a warranty. It's a guarantee that no matter what happens with this knee replacement, the price will not, will not go up. Okay. So that is considered value-based care in the minds of many people. And I would consider it value-based care as well. I would also consider it capitation. It is capitation. It's just not capitation at the person level in terms of their healthcare expenditures for the year. It's capitation at the individual episode level. Now, that works for keeping the unit cost of the procedure down, right? So healthcare cost is a very simple equation. It's the cost per unit times the number of units. It's the cost per surgery times the number of surgeries. It's the cost per scan times the number of scans. Okay, so, cap, so, so bundled payments are an effective way to address the unit cost. However, bundled payments are not perfect in that they do not address the number of units problem. So a bundled payments assumes that that knee replacement is clinically justified in the first place. What if that knee replacement should never have been done? Because frankly, the person needed to lose more weight. They could have had a steroid injection, you know, yada, yada, yada. They could have done some things. Now it doesn't happen all the time. Of course, people are going to still need knee replacements. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that are there situations where people absolutely could avoid a knee replacement? Sure. In a bundled payment scenario, there is no disincentive for the doctor or the hospital to not still take that inappropriate patient to the OR. So it is, it is a tool of capitation, but it still has its drawbacks. So, uh, and that's where, and what's the, what's the practical application of that? That's where the uh, the second opinion program through Walmart and Lowe's, it really addresses that because it's, it's, a, it's a couple of things. So not only is it the, um, the bundled payment for the joint replacement or the spine surgery, but it's also a second opinion program at a center of excellence where the surgeon is on salary. So that's the key to those programs. And they've told me that. Where the key is, is that the surgeon is not going to make more money if they do or do not decide to do the joint replacement. And they will not consider a place a center of excellence unless that financial arrangement exists with the surgeon. 
because then that addresses the unit problem. And the, 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 should you even do this surgery in the first place? Because if you still have a fee for service reimbursed surgeon with a bundled payment, then they are still incentivized to potentially do surgeries when, when it's not clinically necessary. So with that, I will end. You folks have asked wonderful questions. I will just go back to the beginning and say, look, all of this change and progress and helping patients, it's incredibly slow. It takes a really long amount of time. I'm in it for the long haul. I know all of you are in it for the long haul. And I appreciate you being here. I hope you have a great Friday and a great weekend. Bye now. See you next week.